Yes, a very warm welcome to all of you here to the Observer Research Foundation. Um, those of you who know us, and there are quite a few, also know that we do not very often have uh, the opportunity to discuss philosophical, ethical questions. Um, we are a very policy-oriented think tank, as you know. Uh, but um, I'm very happy that uh, we have this opportunity today, and I'm very happy that um, Lukas Meyer is here with us, not only because he's, he's a very old friend and we studied philosophy together in Berlin a long time ago. Um, Lukas is now uh, um, the head of the Department of Philosophy at the University of Graz in Austria, and uh, he has uh, his PhD from um, Oxford University. And uh, what we are going to do is, uh, Lukas will present uh, findings of his paper that he did together with a colleague called Sanjay Pranay Sank Lecha, who is also uh, at uh, Graz University on climate justice. And uh, I'm also very happy that we actually have two discussions who come, discussions who come from different fields. And one of them is, is Professor Shashi Motilal, who is a professor at Delhi University for philosophy. And we, she actually has a PhD from SUNY in Buffalo in, the, in New York University. And uh, we will proceed in that way that Lucas will talk about 30, 35 minutes. And uh, then we will hear an input from, uh, from a philosophical point of view from Professor Motilal. And uh, then I'm also very happy to have uh, Sanjay Vashis with us, who is uh, the director of the Climate Action Network South Asia. And we are also old colleagues. We used to work together on, at the German Heinrich Böll Foundation uh, at, at some time ago. Uh, welcome to both of you. And uh, then uh, Sanjay will present us a more uh, um, climate action-oriented uh, um, uh, response to this paper. And I think this will make uh, for a very interesting discussion. And I'm uh, really looking forward to it. So without further ado, over to you, Lukas. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure and honor to speak here at the ORF. Um, I really look forward to the comments and also to the discussion that we will have. And uh, I'll ask you for some patience, and I hope that this is interesting what I will be able um, to present. So let me just check whether I can do this. I can. Okay, great. So... In order to seriously pursue efforts to limit the global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius, it will be necessary to implement a substantial reduction in global emissions. Emissions or emission rights then become a highly scarce resource, which will have to be distributed between states. Given the correlation between levels of well-being and emissions, this distribution will have a significant impact on states and the level of welfare of their inhabitants, and as such is a matter of high normative importance. Even when restricted to purely normative considerations, there are several factors that must be assessed when coming to a view about how emissions should be allocated between states. One of the important issues here and the source of much political contention is the question of whether past emissions are relevant to determining how the remaining global carbon budget should be allocated between states, and if so, precisely how. Now, considerations of national self-interest are naturally highly relevant in determining each state's position on this issue. To caricature historically high-emitting countries, such as the United States, can generally be expected to insist that the past is irrelevant. Historically low-emitting countries, such as India, can generally be expected to hold that the past is crucial. Nevertheless, both positions can and indeed have been defended on theoretical grounds. In my talk, I want to construct a theoretical bridge between the two positions. I begin from a principled position that high-emitting countries would plausibly want to endorse, and then explore some possible consequences of endorsing that position. The principled starting point comes from an idea Prani Sanklisha and I have developed in other work, namely the idea of legitimate expectations. I turn now to an explanation of that idea, and how it might be used by historically high-emitting countries. 
It turns out that endorsing the idea of a legitimate expectation to continue causing emissions at high levels reflects an understanding of the significance of the past that is similar to the understanding on which the claim plausibly is based that the unequal benefits from historical emissions should be taken into account. At its simplest, we can think of an expectation as a certain kind of prediction about the future. In this sense, people have expectations all the time, and these expectations are often relevant and sometimes even highly important factors in the decisions they make. When an agent, when an agent acts on the basis of an expectation that she has, and this expectation is frustrated, then it is reasonable to say that the agent is harmed because of the frustration of her expectations. It is not at all clear, however, what follows from the fact that an agent would suffer harm from frustration of some particular expectation that she has. To use two examples, consider first a thief who steals a car and now expects to get away with the theft. Because he has this expectation that he gets away with the theft, he makes various financial commitments, at least some of which will cause him harm to get out of. Now let's say his expectation is frustrated and the police catches him before he can profit from the theft. He has certainly been harmed by the frustration of his expectation, but intuitively we would not think that he has any sort of case for compensation or more generally any sort of valid complaint at all. In this case then, the fact that an agent has a particular expectation and would be harmed by its frustration does not generate any kind of valid normative claim of the agent to not be so harmed. But now consider the second case. This case concerns a collaboration that is based on trust and reliability. For quite some time, two housemates, let's call them A and B, have shared dinner on Fridays and have taken turns in preparing dinner. Suppose A prepares dinner this Friday because it was her turn. A relies on her expectation that B will join her for dinner. But this time, B does not appear. A is frustrated. Indeed, A suffers a harm because of the frustration of her expectation. Even though A's expectation being frustrated is relatively insignificant, B would normally be thought to owe her something. At the very least, B owes A an explanation, more likely also an apology. If so, then A's expectation counts normatively. Her frustration calls for some response from B, and A can validly complain about it being frustrated. To oversimplify, let us say that the two cases illustrate illegitimate and legitimate expectations. And again, for the sake of ease, let us say that one of the implications of an expectation being legitimate is that the agent in question has a valid normative claim that the harm of the expectation being frustrated be taken into account when deciding on a course of action that is relevant to whether the expectation is frustrated or not. How can this finding be considered relevant in our context? It seems uncontroversial that individuals in high-emitting countries have a wide range of expectations whose frustration or fulfillment will depend upon climate change and climate policy. For example, they could have expectations about the level of personal emissions that will be permissible in the future. For instance, concerning combustion engine emissions in their private cars. Expectations about the future demand for the skills they were educated in. For instance, when they acquired combustion engine, engine repair skills expectations about the permissibility and affordability of long-distance air travel at the future, expectations about being able to continue to live in areas that are at risk of extreme events owing to climate change, etc. Furthermore, and at the most general level, 
these individuals will have expectations about the ways of life open to them and the ways that will continue to be open to them in the future. This is part of the background against which agents choose and pursue long-term plans and projects, and the ability to do this is an essential part of the good life. These expectations, based as they are on the status quo, are either directly expectations to be able to continue to, continue to emit at current high levels, or they are expectations from which the high emissions expectation can be inferred. Are and under what conditions are such expectations to continue to be able to emit at current high levels legitimate? And what are the normative and practical implications of the legitimacy of such expectations? The situation is complex. On the one hand, it is necessary that global emissions be significantly reduced if we want to meet the 1.5 degree target. And it will simply not be possible for current high emitters to continue to emit at current levels if we want to implement those reductions. Moreover, considerations of fairness seem to minimally require that those with currently high emissions should at least share in the mitigation burden. By way of summary, we can say that considerations of intergenerational justice and ethics generate a requirement that global emissions be significantly reduced and considerations of international distributive justice generate the requirement that the burdens of this significant reduction be fairly shared. But on the other hand, we are confronted with the following considerations. First, the agents whose expectations are frustrated will often suffer harm as a result. In some cases, the harm may be highly significant because it may lead to the agent having to abandon long-term projects and plans that they already have invested in, and heavily so, and in more than just economic terms. Consider, for example, an agent who has formed an expectation that they will be able to live in a particular region in Austria and within its social network, and that owing to climate change, they will be relocated from this region. Second, in many cases, it will be difficult to hold the agent culpable for the expectations they have and for the plans and projects they form on the basis of those expectations. The question is how to make a judgment about these conflicting considerations. Which of these high emission expectations could be considered legitimate. In our earlier work, our conclusion, which I here use as a premise, was that at least some of those expectations can be considered legitimate. One way of cashing out what it means that an expectation is legitimate is to say that if an agent has a legitimate expectation to continue emitting at currently high levels, then this means that the harm the agent would suffer by the frustration of the legitimate expectation is a factor that ought to be taken into consideration when making decisions that affect whether the expectation will be frustrated or not. But what might it mean to take the legitimate expectations of individuals in high emitting countries into account? Importantly, it does not mean that we should not frustrate the expectations of these individuals to continue to be able to emit at their currently high levels. As I said before, considerations of intergenerational and international justice render this a non-starter. Global emissions will need to be significantly reduced, and this reduced global carbon budget should be distributed fairly amongst states. In other words, the fact that an expectation is legitimate does not trump or override other relevant normative considerations. But it is one thing for a consideration to be overridden or to be overridable, and another for the consideration to be ignored or for it to be validly ignorable. And the fact that certain high emission expectations are legitimate entails that they should not be ignored. One plausible way of cashing this out 
is to argue for temporary grandfathering. The eventual allocation of omissions will be whatever principles of justice are held to require, for example, equal per capita. But rather than implementing this allocation immediately, the legitimate expectations of individuals in high emitting countries could be seen as giving us reason to implement a gradual transition toward the ultimate aim of establishing a low carbon global economy with an equal per capita distribution of emissions. Grandfathering, even when qualified by the word temporary, is not a word that is pleasant to hear banded around in the context of allocation of allocating emissions. It suggests some kind of Matthew effect, namely that, quoting the gospel according to Matthew, for unto everyone that had shall be given, and he shall have abundance, but from him that had not shall be taken away even that which he had. Or in more colloquial language, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. My primary interest here lies neither in defending nor denying temporary grandfathering. Rather, I want to point out one important implication of using the idea of legitimate expectations to argue for temporary grandfathering. The central idea is the following. The force of legitimate expectation comes in part, but necessarily, from the past. When one uses legitimate expectations to argue for temporary grandfathering, one is necessarily saying that the past is relevant to determining the forward-looking allocation of emissions. The expectations often have been formed over many generations. This is clearly the case for the expectations of individuals in highly industrialized countries that they will be able to cause emissions on a very high level that allows them to continue their projects and their ways of life. These expectations reflect historical circumstances that states have shaped in significant ways. By supporting the pursuit of certain ways of life and at the implicit expense of others, the highly industrialized states have contributed to setting the range within which people living in these countries choose their long-term projects and ways of life. By doing so, the states have encouraged the people living in their countries in forming the expectation that they will continue to be supported in their pursuit of certain long-term projects and with the associated levels of emissions. If we assume the legitimacy of these expectations, or at least of some of them, and interpret their normative significance in terms of temporary grandfathering, we claim that the past is relevant to determining the leg legitimate shares of the remaining permissible emissions. Now, consistency then demands that the past can be relevant in other ways too. In particular, that the highly unequal levels of past emissions and their consequences in the present and future should matter to determining the allocation of the remaining permissible emissions. I now turn to defending this idea, qualifying it and making it more precise. <coughs> to be sure, we do not care about emissions as such, but about the well-being consequences of emission generating activities. These consequences do differ and dramatically so. So far, the level of welfare realized in a country or region has been strongly correlated with the historical and current levels of emissions of this region. Industrialized countries are responsible for more than three times as many emissions between 1850 and 2002 than developing countries. Industrialized countries have realized large benefits from emission-generating activities, whereas developing countries have derived comparatively small benefits from emission-generating activities. Here, I disregard the highly contested question of who ought to provide measures of compensation for the unavoided damages of climate change. Instead, I focus on the unequal benefits realized from past emission-generating activities. They seem to be relevant for the distribution of the remaining permissible emissions, 
that is the rights of currently and future people to cause emissions as a side product of activities that are meant to benefit them. For we cannot avoid causing emissions and during all stages or during all stages of our lives. Emissions are indeed side product of most or all of our activities. These considerations speak for distributing benefits from emission generating activities fairly over the whole lives of people. When past people pursued actions that have had long-term beneficial effects, then currently living people receive benefits from past emission-generating activities. These benefits should count when we assess the benefits people have realized from emission-generating activities over their whole lifetimes. Also, the benefits from people's own past emission generating activities should count. As the received and so far realized benefits from past emission generating activities are highly unequal, this speaks in favor of unequally distributing the remaining permissible emission rights. Those who have realized less benefits from past emission generating activities of their own or, or of previously living people those who have realized less benefits from past emission generating activities should have the chance to be benefited more from future emission generating activities. And this is also the case for those who predictably will realize less benefits from emission generating activities of their predecessors. Having more or less benefits grounded in past emissions is the second way in which past regarding considerations speak for an unequal distribution of the remaining permissible emissions. Now we have a problem, namely two seemingly conflicting claims concerning the normative significance of past emissions. For the sake of my discussion of these claims, I will assume an understanding of what climate justice requires that has been very common among justice theorists. Disregarding the consequences of the past emission generating activities for the well-being of the currently and future living people, disregarding the consequences of past emission generating activities, the remaining permissible emissions ought to be distributed equally among people. That is, all people should receive an equal per capita share and if so, the shares of states should depend on the size of their populations. So far, I submitted two claims why the shares should be different than equal, both of them reflecting the consequences of past emission generating activities. The first claim reads, we have reason to distribute the remaining permissible emissions unequally as people have realized unequal benefits from emission generating activities owing to their own or previously living people's past emission generating activities. Typically, people in the highly industrialized countries, and thus collectively speaking, the highly industrialized countries, should have less than an equal per capita share, and people in developing countries should have more than an equal per capita share of the remaining permissible emissions. The second claim, the one I introduced at the beginning of my talk, reads like this. We have a reason to distribute the remaining permissible emissions unequally, as people mostly in the highly industrialized countries have a legitimate expectation to continue causing emissions far above the equal per capita <coughs> share of the remaining permissible emissions. For some time, People in the highly industrialized countries, and thus collectively speaking, the highly industrialized states, should have more than an equal per capita share. Should we endorse both or only one of these seemingly conflicting claims for an unequal distribution of the remaining permissible emissions? Politically speaking, we can distinguish two views. India, among other countries, has endorsed the first claim and presumably rejects the second. The United States, among other countries, has rejected the first claim and is presumably supportive of the second claim. In the following, I analyze the coherence of both views by discussing 
where the objections against the first claim hold equally against the second claim and the other way around. In doing so, I investigate the coherence of both views, namely first of rejecting or endorsing the normative significance of the past either only for the beneficial consequences of past and historical emissions or only for having developed the expectation of causing far above average emissions in the pursuance of ways of life typical for highly industrialized countries. And second, I investigate the coherence of endorsing both claims. And I will argue that we should endorse both claims. We can distinguish three objections against the normative significance of historical emissions for the allocation of the remaining permissible emissions. According to the first objection, currently living people should not be made responsible for the acts of their ancestors and should not be put at a disadvantage simply because the people inhabiting the country before them emitted too much. One can raise this objection in defense of the first objection. Sorry, one can raise this objection in defense of the second claim, that is the legitimacy of the expectation to continue causing emissions at a level far above average. Currently living people with that expectation can point out that previously living people and state institutions in the past have established the ways of life and the types of projects that come with far above average emissions, and they themselves could not possibly have been responsible for this historical sociocultural development. Accordingly, these currently living people are not responsible for the high level at which they cause emissions. This is correct in the sense that the formation of the expectation and individual people having the expectation belong to what can be considered circumstances beyond the control of those individuals who have endorsed the typical and widely shared ways of life of people living in highly industrialized countries and elsewhere. This is not to deny that all people are responsible to contribute to a fair solution of the problem of climate change. However, fairness requires taking into account all burdens of implementing the solution, and among the burdens are the costs of having to change one's way of life and changing or giving up the personally important projects whose pursuance under current technological circumstances have high levels of emissions as their side effect. On the basis of the first objection, we can also defend having received unequal benefits from historical emissions, as currently living people cannot be responsible for the long-term beneficial emission-generating activities of previously living people. The fact that currently living people received such benefits by, for instance, having inherited a well-developed infrastructure in their country cannot ground a moral objection against these people. But, and again, this is not to deny that all people are responsible to contribute to a fair solution of the problem of climate change. However, fairness requires a fair distribution of all benefits from emission-generating activities, and thus it requires taking into account the received benefits. According to the second objection, one can only be blamed for a certain act if one knows or is liable to know of the harmful effects of the act, whereas it is debatable whether until recently the knowledge of the harmful effect of emissions was sufficiently widespread. Again, this objection can be thought to be relevant for defending the legitimacy of the expectation in question. Neither previously living nor currently living people can be blamed to have developed the expectation before they became liable to know of the harmful effects of causing emissions that is arguably not before 1995 when the second assessment report of the IPCC was published. This might be correct in the sense that the formation of the expectation till 1995 cannot be considered morally objectionable. But again, this is not to deny that all people are responsible to contribute to a fair solution of the problem of climate change, and this includes a responsibility to change one's expectation insofar as this was and is not over-demanding on people. In any case, fairness requires taking into account all burdens of implementing the solution, 
And among the burdens are the costs of having to change one's way of life and the specific important projects whose pursuits under current technological circumstances have high levels of emissions as their side effect. The second objection is also and analogously relevant when we consider the normative significance of received benefits from historical emissions. While people cannot be blamed for having enjoyed benefits from emission-generating activities before the harmful consequences of emissions were known, they are responsible to contribute to a fair solution which requires a drastic reduction of global emissions as people were liable to have known since 1995. And since we care about the consequences of emissions, the well-being, of him that, that is generated by emission-generating activities over the whole lifetimes of people. A fair solution requires the fair distribution of such benefits among people that is very likely to require to allow those who so far have had less benefits to realize more than average benefits in the future. The third objection points to the relevance of the so-called non-identity problem. No one can claim to be worse or better off than she would be had another climate policy been pursued in a sufficiently distant past. Again, I analyze the relevance of this objection for assessing both claims. When it comes to the expectation in question, it is true that the currently living people would not have come into existence as the individuals they are, had previously living people not established the socio-cultural conditions that generated the expectation among people in highly industrialized countries that they can continue causing emissions at far above average levels of emissions. However, that fact cannot by itself undermine attributing responsibility to fairly contribute to a solution of the problem to these very people. They are bearers of this duty as the persons they are owing to what previously living people did in the past. And a similar claim holds for people's duties to share the received and so far realized benefits from past emission generating activities. They are bearers of this duty quite independent of how they came into existence as the individuals they are. These duties are forward-looking duties of distributive justice that reflect the historically developed conditions under which the current and future duty bearers will have to live up to them. So the past matters for how we should go about distributing the remaining permissible missions. And I suggested the past matters in at least two and seemingly conflicting ways. Owing to the past, we have two reasons to distribute the remaining permissible emissions unequally, or at least temporarily so. First, the ways of life typical for high industrialized countries have developed over a long period of time. People living in these countries and many people living elsewhere have taken part in these ways of life. And by pursuing projects that given today's available technologies have high or very high emissions as their side product. Currently living people cannot be held responsible for past people having developed this way of life. And currently living people cannot be blamed for having adopted these projects. While these people also stand under the obligation to contribute to a fair distribution of the remaining permissible emissions, fairness requires that we take into account the burdens that these people would suffer when they had to give up their projects. Other things being equal, we should avoid frustrating the expectation of these people to be able to continue in their ways of life by pursuing such projects. Second, Currently living people have received more or less benefits from past emission generating activities. Again, currently living people cannot be held responsible for these received <coughs> benefits and for having enjoyed these benefits in highly unequal ways. However, all people stand under the obligation to contribute to a fair distribution of the remaining permissible emissions. Fairness requires that we take into account benefits people have realized from emission-generating activities in their lifetimes. Other things being equal, people who already enjoyed more of these benefits should receive less of the remaining permissible benefits from emission-generating activities. <coughs> <coughs> 
As a matter of coherence, I suggest that one should endorse both claims. The consequences of the past matter. We have reason to take into account the consequences of past activities, both in terms of the costs that people with so far very high levels of emissions have in adapting to a much lower level, and in terms of the fair distribution of benefits from past and current emission generating activities. In our interpretation, both claims reflect a shared understanding why the past matters. The long-term beneficial as well as ways of life shaping actions of both previously living people and state institutions matter owing to their consequences for the well-being of currently and future living people who themselves cannot be considered morally responsible for these actions. Understanding and acknowledging this common ground of both claims could be a way forward in the international negotiations. Understood in this way, highly industrialized countries such as the United States, who reject the idea that the highly unequal benefits from historical emissions count, cannot coherently argue for protecting the legitimate expectations of their citizens in continuing to pursue their ways of life on far above equal per capita levels of emissions. Countries like India, who insist on the normative significance of the highly unequal distribution of received benefits from past emission generating activities, cannot coherently argue that the different consequence of highly unequal past emissions should not count namely the costs of high emitters to adapt to a fair level of per capita emissions. So thank you for your patience. Yeah, thank you very much, Lucas, for this very interesting talk and for trying to establish on a very fundamental uh, uh, level a bridge between these uh, very highly contested positions between actually developing countries and uh, industrialized uh, countries. I would now request uh, Professor Motilal, um, as an expert on, on uh, applied ethics and, and environmental ethics, uh, to give some <coughs> comments on, uh, on the paper. And then uh, we'll have a look uh, with uh, Sanjay Washis on, on the more practical application uh, uh, of, of uh, these theories in, in the climate negotiations. Please, Professor Motila. Thank you. Uh, I must uh, put this on record that I'm very, very, uh, I feel highly honored and privileged to be here today uh, to, as a discussant to Professor Meyer's very thought-provoking uh, presentation. Uh, uh, the paper itself, I think, is very detailed and clear. And therefore, I will just, uh, you know, present a bare outline of the paper so that um. my comments, uh, you know, a few comments that I have uh, would be placed in a context. So I begin uh, with the author's position that the requirements of intergenerational justice call for a global reduction of CO2 emissions and that of intragenerational justice which call for a fair distribution of the burdens of this demand between two stakeholders, one, the developed nations, and two, the less developed or developing nations. The question that the paper raises is clearly about distributive justice, namely, what is a fair distribution and is the past relevant for this? And if yes, then, in, uh, then how? The question is whether an equal per capita distribution ought to be the norm or would some unequal distribution in favor of one or the other stakeholder be a fair norm of distribution. The authors argue for an unequal distribution and examine two arguments in favor of this stand, the argument from legitimate expectations and the argument from benefits realized. The paper, the, so I just give the bare out, outline of the first um, uh, argument, uh, which is the argument from legitimate expectations. The paper explains what could be regarded as a legitimate expectation. Uh, though I have a comment which I'll come to later about this legitimate expectation. But assuming that the expectations of people of industrialized na nations are legitimate, how do these affect future allocations? That's the main question taken up in the paper. Argument proceeds as follows. 
If people are required to adopt mitigating measures, their legitimate expectations will be thwarted, causing suffering. The present generation is not res responsible for past emissions, and they cannot help the expectations to which they have been conditioned. Hence, reducing their rights to emit will cause suffering, which they do not deserve. Hence, the status quo is to be maintained, or at most, temporarily staggered reduc reduction, which he calls temporary grandfathering. This argument is in favor of countries like the United States, and I have used the abbreviation U for uh, the United States as well as all developed countries. The second argument, which is the argument from benefits realized, also uh, acknowledges the relevance of the past. It uh, goes like this, that, uh, and of course, it is an argument given by countries like India, and I would, uh, you know, I'm using the abbreviation I to denote these countries. The argument states that industrialized nations have benefited from the past historical emissions, whereas those in developing countries have not benefited to that extent, which accounts for the fact that these countries are far behind in the development scale. Adopting the principle of polluter pays, the argument could be made that people in the industrialized nations need to pay the price of excessive emissions in the past, which includes having less than equal right to future carbon emissions. If the past is relevant for both the arguments, it follows that an unequal distribution would be fair and should be a factor in determining the allocation of remaining permissible emissions, but unequal in favor of which party? That is the moot question. The authors examine three objections against normative significance of historical emissions for the allocation of remaining permissible emissions. I would not go into the three objections. I think they have been very carefully you know, um, stated and responded to by the author. The paper convincingly responds to the three objections while acknowledging the undisputed point that all people stand under an obligation to contribute to a fair distribution of the remaining permissible emissions. I now would like to place uh, for consideration the comments to the audience as well as the author. Uh, I think uh, the authors have very carefully used the word legitimate expectations and not legitimate claims since the latter amounts to a right and a right to CO2 emissions is a misnomer in my opinion. At best, it is a privilege that comes with a cost. And I think both uh, developing and the developed countries need to take this into account. But with respect to legitimate expectations also, one could raise the question whether they are moral expectations. That is, they are justifiable, uh, taking everything else into consideration. And I, I think that the authors have addressed this question in their earlier papers. It is uh, not explained so much over here, but um, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the conclusion of the paper says that it is really, uh, perhaps it's not a moral expectation. Anyway, uh, we could also, there is one clarificatory point that I would like to draw Professor Meyer's attention to, which is that the expectations of people in industrialized or developed nations, when he says that they are legitimate, then, and then he goes on to talk about, uh, he gives two examples uh, and says, it appears that what he would uh, want to endorse is that the legitimate expectations of the developed and highly industrialized nations is akin to the example of the two housemates uh, where, uh, uh, you know, the expectation of A is thwarted by B, who does not appear for dinner and uh, help with the dinner. Now, the expectations of uh, you the developed countries are derived from past experiences that are causally responsible for the present expectation. It is not an expectation arising out of a contract, understanding, or trust between negotiating nations. If the developing countries retract on their agreed upon cut in emissions, then the legitimate expectations of present generation of developed countries can be frustrated, and it will be like the second example cited in the paper. In fact, at this point, when future emission rights have not been totally agreed upon, to suggest that legitimate expectations, as explained in the example, be considered in future allocations is not quite clear to me, and I would like some uh, 
uh, you know, clarification in that regard. Of course, this is not to deny that there are expectations of you which, when thwarted, are going to cause undeserved suffering, and for that reason, they need to be considered. But they are not legitimate in the sense explained via the second example, in my opinion. They are reasonable expectations and therefore not to be ignored, as uh, Professor Meyer has rightly pointed out, but they could be overridden. Uh, again, the liberal democratic approach to this problem requires us to look at the difference principle as cited by the famous philosopher John Rawls, the Maximin principle which allows for inequalities provided that the move is in favor of the least advantaged party in the scale in order to enable a level playing field. Similar point, uh, a similar point is emphasized by Gandhi too. Uh, though, of course, in a different context when he say, states that, you know, when uh, considering a policy, we must think of the, the, the most disadvantaged person and how the policy is going to uh, help him. Uh, again, lifestyle changes in you, demanded by you standing for the developed countries, USA and others, Demanded by attempts to mitigate climate change will also work towards other common collective global goals like reduction of poverty and disease, conserving natural resources, etc., and therefore is justified. Temperance in an, is an ancient virtue that relates to self-restraint and moderation. A temperate person does not overconsume; He or she lives simply so that others may simply live. One needs to note also, that people in developing nations continue to suffer for no fault of theirs. Developing countries must have access to opportunities to adapt to climate change, which requires permitting them activities generating some carbon emissions. And I think on this point, there is agreement and uh, largely, you know, it's just a comment that I, would I, I wanted to place. Uh, lastly, unintended harm caused to someone also needs to be paid up for. If one should accidentally cause harm, morality requires that we pay up as per our ability. It is not uncommon for societies to make reparations for actions of previous generations just as the future generation would need to do for our wrong actions. In Indian philosophy, their Indian philosophy prescribes a moral obligation to fulfill the debt owed to forefathers to be undertaken by the progenies for wrong actions done intentionally or unintentionally by the forefathers. I think the same logic could be applied here too in the context of uh, the, the effects of cli climate change. The perspective, uh, so the paper talks about an obligation. I would like to just make a few comments about, uh, you know, what kind of obligation we could uh, consider. The perspective of the obligations of power or privilege can be called from the teachings of Gautam Buddha in the Sutta Nipata. Relations among humans, as well as among humans and non-human nature, are asymmetrical. Where one party is more powerful, there is more responsibility on that party to fulfill the obligations it owes by virtue of the power or privileges it enjoys. Buddha argues that since we are enormously more powerful than other species, we have some responsibility towards other species that connects exactly with this asymmetry of power. The argument can be stated as follows. If some action that can be freely undertaken is open to a person, thereby making it feasible, and if the person assesses that undertaking of that action will create a more just situation in the world, thereby making it justice enhancing, then that is argument enough for the person to consider seriously what he or she should do in view of these recognitions. This kind of thinking is to be inculcated in people so that even if expectations are thwarted, that would not lead to suffering but a sense of fulfillment. The question raised in the paper is definitely about distributive justice, but I think in the context, procedural justice is also important. So the question, can heads of state adequately represent interests of citizens in climate negotiations is a question that really needs to be taken seriously. Uh, 
in in my own writings uh, i haven't done as much i must admit but uh, i have developed this concept of what i call human moral obligations and uh, it could be also applied in this context which is that you know we humans have what uh, I have described in my writings on this topic on human moral obligations that we have human moral obligation to preserve, conserve, safeguard the environment for our sake as well as for the sake of the environment. Uh, I think that uh, we need to now go beyond anthropocentric and consider non-anthropocentric climate ethics. We need to promote that. We need to build alliances not only amongst humans to take care of this problem which faces us so starkly in the face, but we also need to look at alliances between humans as well as the non-human nature to see how for our own sake as well as for the sake of nature, we can do things which will help us to resolve issues about climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mutila, for raising a lot of very interesting questions. I think uh, uh, Lucas Meyer will come back to them. And uh, but first of all, uh, sure. Sanjay now has sure. has the task of uh, bridging the gap to the more uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> practical yes. uh, aspects of uh, of these uh, all these thoughts, which is quite a task actually. Thank you. I have slides. If you can just put it, and I need that. Um, um, yeah. This. Thing. Yes. Thank you, uh, Britta. Um, um, slides, I'll start later on, but let me start with um, actually the phrase that uh, Professor Motilal mentioned. Um, and we, I mean, let me say that in Hindi first, and then I'll also translate in English, though you put it very nicely. Um, uh, that's what we say in North India. That means, um, you know, um, uh, uh, the debt of father is to be paid by son. So that's that has been the same. However, uh, we are talking about um, um, legitimate expectations. Let me start with where does this responsibility comes from? It comes from uh, CBDR, which is one of the principal in UNFCCC, common but differentiated responsibility and respective capability also. And in which the responsibility refers to notion that those who are more responsible for causing a problem should take more responsibility for solving it. And I'll just come back to taking up responsibility in the current context, where, where does all the country stands? Capacity refers to the notion, those with more capacity to solve a problem should contribute more to solving it. In fact, um, uh, uh, Professor um, uh, Lucas already mentioned about uh, um, all the added capacity from high emitting activities in the past, which were not known that this will cause a, a problem, but it has been caused by uh, ancestors. But that has also given added uh, capacity to respond to the existing problem. So, so that's that's the second. Um, you know, I'm just breaking this CVDR. And then, of course, one is the need, and and this need is more in the context of developing country, and then also developed countries, and that is basic requirement of countries to guarantee the um, rights, alienable rights of their citizens through development. Earlier it used to be development for developing country. Now it is also adaptation and loss and damage. That has been added as one of the um, responsibility for the developing countries. They need to uh, cater to. And let's look at uh, what does the development um, uh, uh, indicator says about, you mentioned about US and India. Um, um, well, uh, the life expectancy in the US, this is around 20, 20, 2013 data, 79 years, and India, 66. Mean years of school, 12.9 in US and 4.4 in, in, in India. And income, $52,000 uh, in US and $5,000 approximately in India. So that's the development deficit or the capacity uh, we are talking about. Um, and, and this developing, uh, d double burden on developing country. On one side, they need to bridge this um, uh, development gap and primarily not because you know they want to follow the, um, the lifestyle which uh, West has uh, developed, but, but at least give a decent, dignified, life to the people, minimum schooling, uh, um, um, a roof on, um, on, uh, on head, and uh, also food two times, nutritious food and all that. And then I would accept all the um, arguments, Professor, you have made that uh, let's not talk about 1850, that's when the Industrial Revolution um, started. Sometimes we do calculate or 
count historic responsibility from 1850. Or 1950, that's when the fossil fuel use was increased. Most of the consumption started from that. It started peaking from there. And then, of course, 1990 is the third development, uh, uh, historic responsibility date. Uh, not 1995, I would argue more in favor of 1990 because that's when first IPCC report, that's when uh, science said climate change is happening. So I would say that, you know, that, that would be my request, a suggestion that you may like to consider rather than 1995, um, 1990 as a year. Um, and let's look at uh, what does, uh, what, uh, you know, some of the, the uh, our analysis says, and this is basically a fair share report that we do every year. Um, it's uh, done by many organizations. I'll show you the picture uh, uh, logos also. Uh, it's a civil society review of uh, fair share of uh, countries based on nationally determined contributions. This is 2015, and that was this was done when uh, uh, after accumulating all the INDC numbers we received from countries, and that's when we analyzed. Um, so these are the, the organizations uh, who has uh, been steering it. You can see CANSA, old log logo there. This 2015 Climate Action Network, Latin America, Friends of Earth Action Aid and all. And, uh, um, and, and basically, this is the fair share. This is in context of 2030 when we look at um, how what should be the fair share this is, uh, uh, for uh, uh, developed and developing country. And we have calculated on adequacy, capacity, responsibility in context of 1990 also. Um, and and uh, I, I can send you the link. You can also go through the detailed methodology. Uh, but if you look at the fair share, uh, 26 gigaton is the fair share for the wealthier countries. And 9 to, uh, gigaton is the fair share of uh, poor countries, developing countries. Uh, and when we look at Paris Agreement, the national determined contribution, um, 6 ton is what developed countries has uh, committed. And uh, 9 gigaton uh, is what uh, developing countries has committed. And 2 gigaton conditional. If finance and technology transfer is available, one can achieve um, uh, uh, 2 gigaton. And um, another two, you can see that, this, that basically 18 gigaton is the gap uh, that, that needs to be bridged. And we are not talking about this more in ter terms of legitimate expectations. This is more in terms of two degree temperature goal which is going to be anyhow unbearable um, for millions who are um, you know, at the forefront facing the climate impacts. We know what has happened in um, Kerala, we know what is happening in uh, Himachal Pradesh, and there's a huge bill that now, as a disaster risk reduction, developing countries like India need to, need to foot. Um, so that's the gap we are talking about, which is missing. Um, this is US, um, basically this blue dot, blue line, Okay, that's the um, historic emissions um, I'm talking about. And then this blue line is when, uh, it's, if when we take historic emission uh, from 1850, uh, how much they need to reduce? US need to reduce. Yellow one is from 1950, medium uh, progressivity benchmark. And the dotted one is the 1990. And where US is, that's the, can you see those, uh, red uh, color squares, um, that's where these are the numbers. This is 2020 is Kyoto Protocol number and uh, basically a volunteer number. And then 2025 is, the, is what US has committed. In fact, Trump administration has taken them off the table now. This is from November 2015. So that's why uh, we still had number at that point of time, but now we don't have those numbers even. Um, so, so basically that's the status. Uh, 1990, we take, in, uh, we, ex we I agree that yes, uh, let's look at historic responsibility from the latest date, 1990, and uh, I think U.S. is uh, when U.S. announced, they announced it uh, in comparison to 2005, not even 1990. They discounted another 15 years. So, so that's the uh, one um, irony uh, of of negotiations. Unfortunately, we are negotiating ethics, uh, and that's a problem. Uh, because responsibility needs, to, if it needs to be de decided based on ethics, it cannot be, it should not be negotiated. It should be agreed upon. And UNFCCC is all about negotiations. Let's look at India. Um, again, historic uh, emissions, the way they, are, they, are, they have been growing. Um, yellow line is 1950. Uh, and as per 1990, our, um, we can pollute, I would say that. <laughs> for development, not as a right to pollute or for luxury emissions, but more as a development we can pollute as per 1990, but in fact, um, uh, uh, and then look at the uh, 
red band, which is unconditional pledge um, that India has made. Um, and this, this analysis proves that developing countries are at forefront in taking up responsibility, irrespective of the fact that uh, they have not, their ancestors have not caused this problem. Uh, maybe uh, for developing countries it's easier because they are constructing, while for developed countries they need to renovate. And that's, that's how I normally exp uh, explain to, um, to many of my colleagues that uh, maybe renovation takes, is more expensive and uh, you have to break it and then you have to reconstruct it. While um, re uh, construction, ongoing construction can be changed through um, uh, architectural designs, smart architectural designs, and maybe we can achieve faster. <laughs> let's look at, uh, these are the three bands per country. United States, the gray one, let's talk about it. That is 1990. Dark green is 1850. Um, light green is um, 1950. Even if we look at 1990, the black band is what US has, um, committed, put uh, on the table as Paris Agreement, in Paris Agreement. They are way beyond their fair share uh, compared to 1990 levels. Forget about um, 1850 or 1950. And um, Japan, EU, if you look at India, India is very close to its fair share. Um, and India's emissions are higher, maybe for, uh, one of the top fi five countries, because of large um, uh, society. Um, and large number of people who are on survival emissions compared to luxury emissions. And that's the reason that we are still top five, otherwise we would have been, uh, at per capita basis we are very low. And let's, uh, this is per capita actually. Let's look at uh, total mitigation, same status, um, uh, that you know, uh, the total emissions uh, are, um, uh, compared to historic response load 1990 are uh, way below what uh, US or um, EU or um, um, other developed countries like Japan has put, but developing countries have come forward. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop here uh, on, on this slide. My slides are done, but let me come back on a few things that need to be done. Basically, slowly and slowly, through negotiations, developed countries have successfully taken off historic responsibility from the table. It's not in Paris Agreement. Not, not, no, not a single word on historic responsibility has been mentioned in Paris Agreement. It's off the table. So I, I think, and, and now it's more about what you, you, uh, you can give and what, I mean, less I can give and I can take more. Also, uh, efforts are to shift burden on developing country, and that's the unfortunate. And when we talk about climate justice, that's not climate justice. Especially countries who are struggling to achieve development indicators and go higher on human development index, uh, I think uh, they are struggling uh, and they are, they, uh, more, more and more burden is falling on them. There's a double accounting of finance which is going on. In fact, Bangkok session was all about double accounting of finance, that how development aid is being you know, calculated again. We're not talking about compensation. In fact, compensation has been put out uh, um, uh, from UNFCCC primarily because developed countries said it could have a problem in our legal system where we can be challenged in court and we'll face a lot of problems. So we don't want compensation. Fine, other countries agreed with it. All right, we don't want that kind of trouble on you. But let's talk about you know, covering the cost that has been uh, caused because of the, all the actions um, which, were, which polluted the uh, um, um, atmosphere. Um, of course, I'll not talk about uh, uh, um, opposing the loss and damage, which is, which is the case. So what needs to be done? Let's talk about it. Um, my suggestion on paper would be, I think when we talk about legitimate expectations, uh, legitimate expectations uh, need to be built on the modern vision of sustainable future rather than past mistakes. So far in most of the developed countries, and I'll quote US again here, still the, um, uh, the existing, the current generation is continuing the same lifestyle, which is the problem, which is causing the problem. If you're, let's discount them on historic responsibility. What about the current responsibility? They are still continuing the same kind of um, um, uh, lifestyle, and that, that, that is a problem. Um, another is uh, the legitimate expectation should drive um, energy transformation. That's the legitimate expectation of current generation. That's where the current generation will play a responsible role so that the next generation doesn't say, hey, please you know, forget our historic responsibility because earlier generation didn't thought about future or about our future. This is the time to think about it. Um, and, and, most, and I, I would uh, also say 
two, my two suggestions, when we talk about, of course, so far I've been talking about developed and developing country. Let's not talk about developed and developing country. Let's not talk about vertical. Let's talk about horizontal. Basically, rich and poor. Rich and poor in all countries. Rich should be, should be paying. Rich should be taking up the more responsibility, like we pay our income taxes. And poor should be uh, getting all the benefits so that they can grow. But they should not copy the kind of lifestyle that our rich has uh, 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 you know, uh, adopted or has developed in the past. So let's compare orange with orange. Let's compare apple with apple. Uh, so far, we have been talking about comparing uh, apple and orange. And, and, and that's a problem, uh, because uh, that's where um, we will not get a uh, right kind of uh, result. Um, one suggestion, uh, Professor, uh, there's an Indian argument also on historic responsibility that need to be analyzed. So it will be great if that aspects can also be analyzed. Um, so far, you have, you have you did touch upon Indian argument. What does they talk about it? But uh, so far, the paper is, makes a more case that how this historic responsibility can be exempted because the problem was not, not known earlier. I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Sanjay. We have uh, uh, a lot on the table sure. now from, from, from both of you. Uh, and uh, I would like to give uh, Lucas the chance to reply to these comments. And then after that, I would like to open up the discussion to the floor. Please. Thanks. So these have been very rich comments. Thank you very much. Both of you has been great. And I really enjoyed listening to them. So I will just uh, you know, comment on a few things that were said. Maybe I start with what you said at the, at, at the end of your comments, namely what legitimate expectations ought to be about. I think there is a misunderstanding here in how I was talking about legitimate expectations. So I, I said that um, when it comes to the distribution of the remaining permissible emissions, we should start with the premise of equal per capita. And then ask ourselves whether we have reasons um, <coughs> to qualify equal per capita, right? So equal per capita, of course, means that given that the budget is limited, all countries will have to come to close to zero emissions in about 2050. So there is no dispute between the two of us that people in the highly developed countries have to, over the next couple of decades, radically change their lifestyles, unless uh, we have uh, a technological revolution that allows them con to continue to live as they have lived and with, with you know, close to zero emissions. So there's no dispute between the two of us on that. right? The only small dispute that we might have, and I don't know whether we have that dispute, is the dispute about grandfathering, or to be more exact, temporary grandfathering. The argument for that, as I presented it to you, is the following. When we distribute the remaining permissible emissions, we don't care about emissions as such. What we care about are the well-being consequences of emissions. Now, when we distribute emissions, in that sense, namely on the basis of the currency of the well-being effects that the distribution of emissions will have on people, we have to take into account all the costs that people will face. And there is this cost I have been talking about, namely the particular harm that people will suffer when they have to adapt their lifestyles, which have come with very high levels of emissions, two lifestyles with close to zero emissions. And there the argument is that this is a specific harm that needs to be taken into account when we distribute emissions. And that temporary grandfathering, meaning giving them for a short period of time more emissions than equal per capita, could be a way of acknowledging that particular cost that they are facing. Now, I didn't talk in the paper about the amount of emissions that we should attribute to these people, to people like us here in the room, right? We are talking about us, all of you, I think, belong to these people who could make this claim. I didn't talk about the amount of emissions that should be attributed to them, and I think it is a rather small amount, in fact, right? 
but I use that argument because I think most of us will want to endorse this argument when we think about it, because that argument, if interpreted correctly, or at least how I interpret it, rests on the idea that the past matters, rests on the idea that we have developed this way of life owing to the way in which we have socialized, and that is a consequence of a long history of social practices that have been developed by states, that have been supported by states, and so forth. Right? Now, this was my way into saying, look, if we, if states, highly industrial states, want to endorse this kind of argument, then they also have to acknowledge that the past, meaning the consequences of past emissions, matter in a different way. And that's the way in which, you know, I think that historical emissions matter crucially, namely in terms of the highly unequal benefits that people have realized owing to the emission-generating activities by previously living people and owing to their own past emission generating activities. Okay? So the coherence claim is, well, if you, if, you, if you want to make the point about grandfathering, temporary grandfathering, taking into account the specific harm that those who have emitted high face, then you also have to accept the relevance of these past emissions in the second way. Right? And I think the amount of emissions that should be unequally distributed on the basis of the second argument is much, much higher than the amount that needs to be redistributed on the basis of the first argument. So I've been arguing, right? At least how, that's how I understand the argument. I've been arguing for the position of developing countries to have a far higher share on of the uh, remaining permissible missions on the basis of per capita. Acknowledging at the same time that there is an argument to be made for temporary grandfathering, okay? So that's just to, to, to clarify, ho hopefully clarify the small dispute that we might have. So I'm not saying that people like me can have the legitimate expectation that they continue to live the ways of lives that they have lived. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that they can have the legitimate expectation that they are being supported in transitioning to a low carbon way of life. Because they face a specific harm owing to the way of life that they have been that they have been living, right? Owing to the high level from which they start. Now, maybe a second comment. Uh, both of my commentators raised the idea of reparations or compensation for past emissions. Now, it was mentioned, and you mentioned it, that in the international negotiations, claims to compensation or reparation owing to the consequences of past emissions have been rejected by not only the US, but many other um, OECD states. Now, the reasons for rejecting them, these claims to compensation and reparations, are various. But philosophically considered, these claims are actually difficult to defend. Why is that so? Because normally understood, claims to compensation and claims to reparations require that you identify a wrongdoer. But for many of these past emissions that we are talking about, the agents that we can identify as causally responsible for the emissions cannot be blamed for having caused the emissions. So there is no moral wrongdoer to be found here, right? So the question of compensation or reparation is at least a very difficult question uh, to be raised and more difficult even to be defended. Whereas the claim that I'm making that we should take into account 
the consequences of these past emissions in terms of the well-being that people have realized today is not a claim about compensation or reparation, but a claim about distributive justice. So you can forget this debate about, you know, can they be wrong? Should they, you know, have acted otherwise and so forth? But instead, you just look at the current state and the future consequences and ask yourself from the perspective of distributive justice whether this is fair or what could be considered fair given the consequences of past emissions. I myself defend the idea of reparations for past emissions for some emissions, right? So I think we are getting into a situation owing to the fact that since 1995, the emissions have been culpable or at least potentially culpable. We are getting in a situation where in the future claims to reparations can be defended. So I, I defend the idea in principle, but I think so far the parts of the past emissions for which the claim can be shown to be valid is very small. Okay. Now, you, you kindly made the remark about um, the legitimate expectations concerning high levels of emissions not being analogous to the expectations of the two housemates. And I fully agree with this, and I just want to underscore this and support this. So when I introduced um, these two examples, I didn't mean to introduce the example of the housemates as an example that uh, is relevantly analogous to the legitimate, what I consider legitimate expectations of um, people with high levels of emissions. The examples were introduced to make the point that expectations can be legitimate and illegitimate. Just to introduce the idea that when we talk about expectations, it makes sense to consider the normative question whether they are legitimate or not. Okay? When it comes to um, the expectation of high emitters, there are two features that make this expectation different from the expectation of the housemates. One feature is the harm that people with high levels of emissions will face when they are forced to reduce these emissions dramatically in a short period of time. That harm will be significant. Whereas the housemates, A, I call the housemates, frustration about housemate B not showing up, that is not a significant harm. It's not a serious harm. Okay, yes, that is a serious harm. And the second very important feature that comes into play when we talk about the emissions of high emitters is that the formation of that expectation is, you pointed it out yourself, is not something that is owed to people agreeing on something, but on something that has come about in a long historical process. So that those who have formed these expectations, the high emitters, they cannot be thought of as those who had will, you know, freely to um, have uh, developed those. So I think it's a specific type of expectation that we, that we talk about. Now, maybe my last remark, because I shouldn't talk too long, right? Um, there was the idea and you raised it, and I think you picked it up also, that when we talk about justice and discuss justice in this context, what we should really talk about is our natural duty to contribute to a just solution. Right? So the idea, at least that's the way how it's being expressed in the political philosophy of John Rawls and others is that independent of the existing institutional arrangements in place, people share a duty that they make the situation just. 
okay, that they bring about a situation where they can live under conditions of justice with each other. Now, the, I'm, I'm presupposing this idea in what I'm, what, what I'm saying here, because if you wouldn't presuppose this idea, I, don't think, I think what I'm saying is a non-starter. Right? Without having this idea in place, why should we care about the justice or not of the distribution of the remaining permissible missions? Of course we share this idea that what we really want and intrinsically value right, is living under conditions of justice with each other and globally. Right? So we share that idea. It's not something that I dispute or would like, would like to put on the side. It's a presupposition of talking in the way in which the three of us have been talking. But this idea, natural duty of justice, of course, doesn't answer the kind of questions that we discuss here today. Right? So what does it mean for you, for me, to contribute to bringing about a just situation when it comes to going about climate change? That is something that we you know, need to discuss and where I wanted to make a contribution. Last remark, the ability to pay principle, meaning the principle that people who have more power to change the situation is connected right, to the natural duty of justice. So one way in which it's being spelled out, the natural duty of justice is, well, we all have this natural duty to justice, but depending on who we are, it means something different to us because we have different options to contribute to make the place where we live more just or make it the case that we live under conditions of justice. So the ability to pay principle in the context of climate change says, well, yes, those who can do more to make the situation more just, they should do more, they ought to do more, they stand under the obligation to do more. Now look, what I have been saying here is that the past matters, right, in the second way, namely by making it the case that people have benefited very differently from emission generating activities of previous living people. And as I stressed, this means having more benefit, it means that they are better off people, okay? So of course, when you then apply a principle like I did, equal per capita with qualifications, that means that those who have more will have to contribute more to the bringing about of a just regime of climate change. Right? So one way to understand uh, my contribution is uh, to say that it supports the idea that depending on the level of well-being, on the level of welfare realized by people, their obligations differ. And I think this is a way to interpret the ability to pay principle. I stop here. Yeah, thank you very much for that clarification. I think that that is very <coughs> important uh, um, to give the context of, of your paper. I don't want to ask anything myself now because there's only half an hour left and I would like to open this to the floor. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Uh, as a gentleman here and after that Peter Rimmele, I call, collect three at a time and then uh, we go forward and this gentleman here. So uh, yeah, I am Atul. You have Benvolta. a mic and uh, yeah, Mr. Rimmele, maybe you want to come to the front. Uh, yeah, Atul Gandotra here. I am not uh, from uh, the business or philosophical world, so perhaps the way you guys have made the presentation, it's absolutely thought-provoking and brings about a lot of debate in the mind. So I will not comment as an Indian or a man from a country which, is contributed, which has contributed less towards carbon emission as of now. I'll talk as a citizen of this world. According to me, Climate is something which is common to everyone, irrespective of whichever place you are from. There are no boundaries. It, it goes, moves around. 
the very thought of carbon emission i am sure without much knowledge about it has come from those who have contributed more towards carbon emission in the world and realized before people from impoverished nations that yes it's going to be a big big problem so after having touched the open the pandora box now if we talk about justice to my mind justice is definitely that in the event of an eventuality somebody who has a bigger capability to address that eventuality must be contributing more so therefore the very idea of carbon emission and 1.5 degree centigrade we talking about it's going to make the whole world in hospitable whether they are from america or from india the recent flood in kerala is not a selective flooding that emission was in us and flooding was in kerala it can happen in the heart of us recently the temperature in europe has crossed 43 44 45 degree what's happened over there so in view of that this is a common heritage it is expected that justice is only when there is a contribution coming in based on the capability and ability so in in the developing countries or in under developed countries still the life is towards having two square meal life is life is having about nutritional nutrition basic nutrition that's all and in the developed world the kind of garbage which is being produced by an individual is equal to what can feed 10 people in developing countries or developed countries so in view of that according to me it's a common heritage the contribution has to be not equal it has to be proportionate then only we can think of 1.5 and we can save the world otherwise there's a quote which i got in this uh, orf only which says the strong will do what they can the weak will suffer because they must thank you very much peter remle konrad arena foundation i'd have a question to professor meyer and a commentary for what sanjay had said <coughs> to to cut it a bit short before you argue a little bit let's not look into the classical pattern of looking for responsible ones we might not find them doesn't that contradict a little bit uh, the topic climate justice why the past matters isn't the past a matter of responsibility and and that is what what sanjay picked up by his thing well responsibility can be inherited uh, with your indian proverb and that should be done in any way uh, uh, coming back to that one what instruments did you use if i if i delete the word climate and read justice why the past matters probably it would be applicable for many fields the entire field of colonialism whatever is there we have a pattern that at least rich countries feel somehow responsible for poverty alleviation in in poorer parts of the world so we have patterns there or or approaches uh, did you find general ones in other fields or what you did for climate justice is entirely based on let me say climate issues and with the statistics and historic development historic development also 1850 let's not look at it but so when do we start looking at it <laughs> it goes we cannot put some artificial cut of date i guess uh, two statements from from sanjay where i was not so 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 happy with I said, yeah. The, the idea is let the let the rich countries pay, and 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 for the poorer ones. What's a rich country? What's a poor one? Congo is very rich. It has a poor population. Japan is very poor. It has no resources, but a rich population. So shouldn't we then also take governance issues somehow into approach? Well, we should continue financing extremely corrupt countries for not changing what they could do to make their people better off. this is just one way uh, the other statement was a bit like uh, shortly uh, we are fine in india uh, statistically uh, we are there where we are with the uh, size of population now does that help us in december when the air pollution in delhi is that lousy again um, maybe we should uh, not take it that simple and look into distribution within a country or other approaches thank you i i think there's already the the response oh, sure.
Lukas, willst du weiter noch? Ja, ja I, let's see. I wonder whether there is any dispute between the two of us, right? And, and maybe you want to come back, right? And tell me what the dispute is. So, I do think that responsibilities, and I have been talking only of responsibilities of distributive justice, right? And here, responsibilities mean that you do your fair share, that these responsibilities come in different sizes, if you like, right? So some have to give more than others, and the argument that I've been making was, well, there's an argument to be made on the basis of consequences of past emissions that show that some, namely those who have benefited more from past emissions, now have to give up more, meaning have to contribute more to a future just distribution of the remaining permissible emissions. So, you know, the, the idea um, that with uh, stronger capabilities come stronger responsibilities seem very much in place of what I've been saying. So I'm not, I mean, you know, I, I restricted my discussion to responsibilities of distributive justice, okay? Of course, you can open um, the discussion and say, well, look uh, into other types of responsibilities that people have. Compensatory responsibilities was an issue that was raised before by my commentators. And then you have a different understanding of what it means to have stronger responsibilities, right? Namely, those who caused um, the problem to a stronger degree, they have then stronger responsibilities to address the problem, to make it the case that people do not suffer from the consequences of the problem they have caused. Okay, so do you want to come back? That's fine. Right. Okay. Yeah, this, this is, I think this is a topic which cannot be discussed just over here in one or two questions. I may have to say many more things, you know, to that. But perhaps maybe over TV we can discuss some other time. Right. I, I said what I wanted. Yeah, yeah no, I, 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 I didn't mean to, um, you know, have the last word on this or anything like that. I just wanted to test whether we have we have something here um, in common. Now, um, Remmel is the name, right? Is it? Yeah, okay. Now, I... <laughs> so, I do think that there is an argument to be made for inherited responsibilities, right? This argument is not an argument um, that can be made on the basis of considerations of distributive justice. Distributive justice, as it is understood in the contemporary political philosophy, at least of the contemporary political philosophy since Rawls in the Western discussions, is a forward-looking approach. So what we are interested in is are just outcomes. We are not interested in the causes of the situation that we are in, but we are interested in making the situation now and in the future a just one in terms of the outcomes, in terms of the distributions when we talk about distributive justice. So this notion of inherited responsibilities does not come into the picture on when you restrict yourself to a discussion of distributive justice. There are problems in bringing in inherited responsibilities in the context of climate change, but also in other contexts that you mentioned, when you mean to bring in these ideas as being applicable to individual people, right? I, I gave you some of the objections, um, and one of the objections is, well, why should I, meaning me, Lucas Meyer, right? why should I be responsible for what my grand 
uh, what my predecessors did. In a strictly, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in a strict way of moral responsibility, I can't be responsible for what my predecessors did because I had no way whatsoever to hinder them from what they did, okay? So when you want to bring in the notion of inherent responsibilities, I think you need to rely on somewhat different notions of justice, namely the notion that people belong to transgenerational communities and as such, namely as members of such communities, they share into a responsibility for making good what was done in their name by previous members of these communities. And that has been also institutionalized on the level of states, right? So there is state liability for what was done in the name of the state in the past. So when we talk about, for instance, um, the duties that the German state has concerning Southwest Africa, given that Germany then was, as the colonial power was responsible for the genocide committed against the Herre or Nama, we are not talking about Lucas Meyer having a responsibility for what was done then, but we are talking about the liabilities, legal liabilities of the state of Germany for what was done in the name of Germany when Germany was a colonial power. So I'm not opposed, right? It's not that I'm being opposed against um, bringing into that perspective of inherited responsibilities. But I think when we do this, we change the discussion. We change the discussion from talking about distributive justice to communal duties of justice. And we change the discussion of individual duties of justice of the distributive kind to inherited duties of justice at a collective level into which people as individuals can share as members of these transgenerational communities. Thank you. Uh, well, um, two questions on which country is rich and which country is poor. I think um, uh, you're right. Um, in, in the present uh, geopolitical context, uh, things may be different, but um, uh, when the UNFCCC basically convention was uh, came in place, that's when um, developed and developing countries were um, distinguished based on the income um, uh, criteria. And why income criteria? Because there has been a lot of theories which are uh, which are proven, which says that higher the energy you consume, higher the income you you have. There is an energy ladder. We, have, we must have seen in many reports where they, they, it talks about what kind of uh, energy a fuel um, a, a poor uh, family uses and what kind of fuel uh, um, uh, rich uh, um, family uses. So there have been uh, those cases also. I, I, and I did made, uh, uh, you know, I did suggest it that rather than talking about developed and developing country, we need to talk about rich and poor, um, um, uh, be it developing country, be it uh, developed countries. Um, so so I, I would still stick to that, that we need to talk about uh, equity in that context and um, um, responsibility in that context. Talking about, yes, there are a lot of responsibilities in, uh, in um, uh, by the, basically in the context of good governance by, by the countries. Uh, for example, in India, air pollution, which has been a kind of a uh, good governance, not good governance, I would say governance failure that air pollution is, is being caused. And uh, at least the the best part of this is that, you know, and can South Asia has a, has a, has a position there where we do, um, you know, uh, advocate for a stringent measures to curtail um, air pollution. But then, you know, this government is accountable to the people after every five years. The problem is internationally, what Developing country of people who are suffering, they demand, they cannot demand from their own countries because they have not been responsible. In spite of that, they've taken up the most, uh, most of the um, effort, I would say, not burden on themselves. And then it's other countries, they cannot, you know, they cannot demand. It's not that they are voting for them after five years. So th that's where I think, you know, global and uh, national narrative um, differentiate. But there are national agenda. 
which uh, countries need to uh, fulfill and uh, we are certainly you know um, in favor of a sustainable development environmental clean development um, but globally i think that's where countries are trying to beat uh, itself and trying to have a monopoly a kind of different kind of monopoly to do less and to claim more I, if I may, I may uh, follow up on that uh, point that you made, Professor Mayer, about, uh, you know, that it is difficult to identify from the past people who are responsible for, uh, you know, the present state, okay? Now, the point is, if we can derive the benefits without knowing who is the cause of us receiving the benefits, and we can be quite complacent about that, enjoy the benefits and so on, why can't we in a similar vein say that I need not know who the causal, who is uh, to be blamed because it's not a blame game, but it is a question of responsibility. So it's like if I can take the benefits, why should I not be also responsible for the, you know, the, the, the hazards that have been caused by that? So. Is it necessary to know who, because this is not a blame game. We are not saying thank you for giving us the benefits and, uh, you know, terrible. You know, you are to be blamed for uh, the, the, the hardship that we are facing. It cuts both so, ways, I think. So let, me, let me be clear. I think we absolutely agree on this, right? So we are, you are saying, if I understood you correctly, Sashi, you are saying, look, if people are in the position of having received these benefits, then this is normatively significant in the sense that they are now standing under the responsibility to share the benefits with all people, including those who have received far less, in an equitable manner. And I fully agree with that, right? That was my argument, right? So the argument is, Historical emissions, meaning the consequences of, of historical emissions, matter because they have benefited people unequally. And depending on how people have been benefited, they will have to give up more or less of uh, these future benefits, given now that the resource, namely emissions, as a side product of, of almost all of our activities, has become a limited resource. So I'm, we are fully agree with that. We fully agree with this. Now there is a second side of what you said, right? The second side of what you said is well, doesn't this also apply to the harms that have been caused by these past emissions? And I didn't talk about this aspect, right? And again, we agree on that. So I think that when you talk about a fair deal on climate change, you have to take into account all costs and all benefits. And among the costs are, what also was mentioned by my other commentator before, among the costs are the unavoided damages and the future unavoidable, practically speaking, unavoidable damages from climate change. So when you want to come up with a fair distribution of the remaining permissible emissions, you also have to take into account these costs that people um, suffer from or that are burdens on people in highly unequal ways. It's a, a dimension that I haven't talked about. And again, my argument would be that for most of these costs, usually discussed under loss and damages, right? For most of these costs, the distributive rationale Will, can guide us in coming up with a fair solution. We do not have to rely on a compensatory rationale for arguing for a fair distribution of the costs of addressing um, these damages. The same applies to the highly unequal costs of adaptation that people have in order to avoid the damages from climate change. Right, so that's the picture, right? That I that I'm 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 trying I'm trying to draw here. Take distributive justice seriously. Consider the problem as a problem of um, benefits and harms, highly unequal benefits, highly unequal harms, and then ask the question: Given the situation that we have reached, what would it mean to bring about a fair distribution of 
the costs and benefits judged on the basis on in the currency of what has been dubbed emission lines. So I have the gentleman here and Matthias Kisselbach on the list. If there's any other question, <laughs> otherwise I think we are running out of time. Uh, then please you and after that Matthias. Yeah. Thank you uh, for this opportunity. I'm Rajiv Sodi. Uh, I wanted to, uh, I'm not an environmental expert or any of that, but I've been listening to this conversation. Is there any uh, uh, method of, uh, uh, you know, the countries or states sticking to the agreement? Because what I heard is that there are, you know, three or four different agreements from Kyoto to then, and, the you know, they keep changing because as the regime changes or some because of political pressures and people withdraw, so there is no agreement. And uh, then it falls and we have to start all over again. Uh, second part is that 18 uh, gigaton gap, uh, which exists in spite of all the agreements. So it's still not, uh, there's no agreement to solve the problem. And uh, is there a way to allocate that and then let everyone become responsible? Because if you do just half a job, then I don't know what is the impact or how, how long can you survive the impact of... Uh, that. So there's nobody thinking about the 18 gigaton. So this is a question. So yes, um, uh, Matthias Kieselberg from the German Research Foundation. Just a question for Professor Meyer as well. So I realize that part of your argument was internal in the sense that you're addressing somebody who calls for grandfathering. And I think in particular somebody who calls for grandfathering on the basis of some implicit theory about legitimate expectations or the harms that result from having them frustrated. And then you're telling them, look, if you, if you have this theory of, 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 of legitimate expectations, then you're already committed to taking the past seriously. And then you also have to do it in other ways, uh, and in particular in ways that are not favorable to you, American or German, but to a citizen of the poor, of a poorer country. Um, so you are so you have to take the past seriously in other ways as well. And my my <laughs> question is: Is it the past that is relevant, or is it the current distribution of advantages and disadvantages that you have? You have, I think, been gesturing in the last few answers towards that was my feeling, and I'm wondering if it's true towards saying write it. It's not so much sort of the causal history or, or, or the past that we are taking seriously here. What really matters is where you where you currently stand in the distribution of goods and advantages and so on. And uh, 18 gigaton. Um, Kyoto Protocol didn't have a compliance. It had a compliance that you know other countries will put, will will you know act against it. But there was no very concrete com uh, compliance. So, uh, so compliance was never acti activated against Canada um, for that matter because Canada withdrew from Kyoto Protocol. U.S. already withdrew. They never ratified, but Canada vid ca Canada withdrew after ratification. So uh, there was no no um, uh, action on that. And um, you're right. Uh, in Doha COP in 2012, it was agreed that uh, developed countries will continue Kyoto Protocol 2, starting from 2012 to 2020, which we call it pre-2020. And then developing countries will come on board from 2020 to 2030. That is post-2020. Um, unfortunately, Paris Agreement was ratified. Basically, regime from 2020 to 2030 has been ratified. But uh, Kyoto Protocol 2 was never ratified by developed countries. Developing country also, they ratified, but developed uh, countries never ratified it. So basically, they backtracked on their um, 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 promises, and they basically made sure that uh, whatever developing countries have committed to them, that, that, that moves further. And now in the Paris rule book, negotiations are going on. We are hoping that there will be a draft on uh, a Paris agreement rule book will be ready by end of this COP, coming COP in Poland. 
and that's where compliance will be one of the element. But how st stringent that will be? Because so far the negotiations are wherever developing countries need to follow the rules, those rules are detailed and um, stringent. Wherever developed countries need to follow, this is the status of negotiation. Uh, the, the rules are very vague. Still they are very vague and very limited progress is happening on that. So that's the problem. 18 gigawatt, I don't know. I think we may have to look for another planet. <laughs> I cannot say anything about that. Unless there is some technological breakthrough, there is a vacuum cleaner but that can uh, clean only greenhouse gases, leaving oxygen and carbon dioxide as it is. We don't know. Thank you. Of course, the problem facing us is how do we, you know, uh, fairly uh, distribute the permissible CO2 emissions that we would all agree upon. How do we fairly distribute those? However, as Professor Meyer's paper has amply, you know, argued for, that the past definitely, so it's not that, okay, so let's start from now and look forward and do good things to make, you know, our goals achievable. But the question is that in this fair distribution, does the past matter? And I think it matters <laughs> in many ways. Uh, in many, many respects, in many cases, you can say, let's leave the past alone, let's look forward. But this is a case where we are, you know, each party is, has to sacrifice something to gain something. And in that case, I think it is intuitively, you know, somewhere it just does make sense that, look, if I have, like I said, so, so suppose I cause an accident on the road. I didn't intend to hurt the person who gets hurt, but morality requires that I, you know, help the person and do the needful to give as much help as I can because even though I did not intend to hurt, it was caused by me. I think these simple examples just tell us that the past must matter. And, uh, you know, where you draw the line, 1850, 1990, okay, these are things that can be negotiated, but we cannot totally ignore the past. So it's as simple as this. If I have gained and enjoyed that, then if... And inherited also. Inherited, I, I, I must also say, you know, that I inherit both the bouquets and the brick bats, as one says. So, you know, I need to do that. that I, this is just a submission. These questions, I should say that, you know, when I talk about issues of justice, how answers that we come up with in this debate translate into proposals for a political solution depend on so many factors that by discussing the justice issues, you do not take into account that there is no easy way right, to come from answers to the questions of what would be required on the basis of justice considerations to what seems politically feasible or the best way of taking the next step in the negotiations. So you raising um, these questions, I think, just shows how limited the discussion is that uh, I have presented. It's not that political philosophers uh, can't contribute to this. I think they do contribute to this discussion right, by setting certain criteria for judging options on the table. So for instance, I think that the kind of argument I made makes clear that um, when states on the negotiation table say uh, historical emissions may not be taken into account in our discussion, we can tell them, well, look, um, I think you are mistaken. Just consider your own argument that you make for grandfathering here. Right? So, so there is not, it's not that, that, that we don't contribute uh, to what uh, can be considered a rational way of um, negotiating the issue, but the more empirical question, namely what kind of argument you should bring to the table to make progress, right? That's a question that I haven't even touched on. So I think, you know, um, it's, a good, it's a good point that you're making um, that shows the limitations of um, this kind of um, contribution. Now, your 
a point is a very interesting point, I think. Now, I think that legitimate expectations in the context of um, climate change, namely the legitimate expectations of the high emitters, that these legitimate expectations can be considered legitimate only when their formation is considered, is taken into account. And the formation is of a certain type, namely of a type that makes clear that at least for some or for a certain range of these expectations, individuals cannot be held culpable for them. And why? Because these expectations are a result of a long history of collective actors, including states and importantly states, having brought about a regime where these options are the options that have been open to people, which then, you know, leads to certain practices being developed and people being successful, more or less in them, um, making investments in projects, uh, choosing them, and so forth, right? That's the, that's the story here. So for the legitimacy of these expectations, the past matters in that sense, right? That for showing that these expectations are legitimate, um, you need to take into account the historical formation. When you do that in your argument for legitimate expectations, you cannot deny that this kind of historical story about the effects of emission generating activities of previously living people have other effects also. And these effects need to be taken into account if you were to present a full picture of what a fair way of taking them into account would be. Now your point is to say, wait, but now consider a world in which the distribution of benefits have come about in a different way, causally speaking. <coughs> so it's not, you know, the past emission generating activities, but some other cause. I mean, you know, some we can, can now come up with some a science fiction story here, right? And I agree with you, if we had a different story, right, then the past would not in the same way come into play because it might be that we don't have legitimate expectations, but the situation that people have very have in their lifetimes realized very different amounts of benefits would could still be relevant for our distributive understanding of what they owe to each other in terms of the fair distribution of future benefits. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks to Lukas Meyer and to uh, Mrs. Motilal and Sanjay Vashist for this very interesting discussion. I, um, it was a bit of an uh, experiment because uh, we usually do not bring in philosophical discussions into, uh, uh, into uh, our political uh, analysis. But uh, I think, and I hope that, uh, that you also uh, agree with that, uh, we, we live in a situation where um, very often political discussions are gridlocked. And, and I think what, what, what I take away from this discussion is that, that it really helps to bring in uh, other disciplines uh, and broaden the base of the discussion in order to uh, overcome certain uh, limitations that are there and uh, are often very polarized. So I, I thank you all for, for your contributions to that. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you.